In this episode, I am joined by Dr. Alexander Arguelles, linguist, world-renowned polyglot, and scholar of comparative religion. In this episode, Dr. Arguelles recounts his unusual upbringing in counterculture America, traces his academic career through institutions such as the Universities of Columbia and Chicago, and details his remarkable life as a scholar and teacher. Dr. Arguelles illuminates the inner world of the polyglot, listing his dozens of ancient and modern languages, and revealing his methods of study, his surprising daily routine, and how deep immersion in language families such as Germanic or Romantic can unlock all related languages without the need for extensive study. Dr. Arguelles also reflects on his own spiritual life, including his mystical conversion to Catholicism, the unraveling of his vocation as a Benedictine monk, his time in Buddhist meditation retreat, and the ways in which a life of study and language learning can be a profound spiritual path of meditation. So, without further ado, Dr. Alexander Arguelles. Professor Alexander Arguelles, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. Well, I'm so delighted to be speaking with you today. And, you know, I interview many different guests, and I always learn something from them. But occasionally, I have the additional pleasure of interviewing one of my own teachers. And you, Professor Arguelles, are one of those. I thought I might give a bit of context about that, just out of it for interest um, as to how we know each other. You offer all sorts of programs in what you call your academy, adult education programs of various types. And I've been studying with you comparative religions, going through the history of religion and uh, that whole area of study. Very fascinating indeed. We've been reading great books, Herodotus, Thucydides, Plutarch, and we're about to begin in only a few days, Tacitus. Mm -hmm. And also languages. You offer a bewildering array of languages, as befits a polyglot. And we've been doing Latin. And I think you're about to begin Sanskrit also, perhaps. And if that happens, I'll certainly join. So who knows, uh, if you're listening to this, we might be in a Sanskrit class together. That would be fun, I think. That would, yes. <laughs> yeah. It's organized. And it's, it's almost like the tutorial system in Oxford. Small group discussions based on a sign reading and so on and various learning activities. And this, to have access to that kind of an intimate small group learning setup uh, with you know scholars such as yourself is is really wonderful opportunity I've been enjoying it greatly so we're going to talk about your life and we're going to talk about language learning and study and we're going to talk about the spiritual component of those which is I know a very deep vein in your own mm -hmm. orientation but before we do that maybe you could just say a few lines about the academy its purpose and what it offers I understand it represents the actualization of a dream of yours, in fact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. Um, I'm so happy that uh, I'm doing this and that I have people like you in it. That's the most rewarding part of it to have. I mean, it's hard to even think of you as a student, you know, just uh, fellow learners like you uh, engaging on this journey for me. I've been a university professor my whole life, and I've enjoyed that career uh, enormously, much more so than any other career I, I know of. That's why I stayed in that. But um, it has its limits and, you know, what you can teach and the kind of students that you have and the other sort of administrative things that you can do. And I've never really been able to teach um, what I really want to teach. I mean, how to become a polyglot, how to become polyliterate. I mean, how to really read and use large numbers of languages. And um, as soon as the internet started getting sort of a presence, there was a forum going back on 20 years ago where I started writing uh, lots of articles and sort of had my own sub forum there for a while. And way back then I articulated the desire of what would it be like to have sort of an ideal program for developing polyliteracy, the ability to really read and, and, and compare and discuss material in, in various languages. And so, yes, I've been thinking about this, uh, talking about it, uh, wanting to do it for, yes, going on 20 years and uh, never did it until now because I always imagined that it needed to be, as we Americans say, brick and mortar. I wonder if you use that same expression, you know, a physical place. I would still like for it to have a physical basis, but during the um, the, 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 the COVID lockdowns, when the institution where I was had to develop uh, online delivery, um, I had a very positive experience with that, conceiving of and developing a precisely a, a German literature reading and, and discussion circle. And I realized that, hey, this, this does work very well. 
And so I uh, got the courage to take the, the plunge and started virtually. Yes, as you said, uh, we're coming up on exactly a one-year anniversary. We started uh, offerings uh, last May, uh, so coming right up on that. So that's that's how I came to it. Yeah, fascinating. And something I've learned from from my my various teachers and, and indeed clients and so on is, as the saying goes, if you find a good teacher, learn what they have to teach. And I think um, I feel very lucky to have crossed paths with the academy. Well, and I enjoy having you. And it, I mean, the special thing is, you know, we've got numbers of people like you from from different walks of life. There's, you know, we've got a we've got a symphony orchestra conductor, and uh, we have an acupuncturist, and we have, you know, medical doctors, and we have, uh, you know, retired professors of musicology, and we have all sorts of people that are really interesting. And you know, and and again, the the whole. Uh, removing the burden of needing to be in a specific program and getting credits and grades and stuff like this, and just having people be there who really want to learn, who really want to to enrich their minds. I'm I'm particularly um, I don't know what the right word is. I'm looking for maybe humbled or you know, just impressed by the fact the number of people that we have who are not humanities people who are not you know interested primarily first and foremost in languages and literatures and religion and stuff, but who have had mathematical or scientific careers and are now looking to become well-rounded. And wanting to read and discuss great books and wanting to learn more things. I wonder if there were an academy of of uh, of a virtual academy like this for math and sciences, how many humanities people would be enrolled there? So, um, yeah, we're really lucky to have a, a number of people like you, uh, who are very fascinating people in your own right, have you know really interesting careers of different walks of life. And I think what's really really rewarding for me uh, is the fact that most of you are like you yourself are not just taking one course, one not just enrolled in one circle, but in a, in a good handful of them, so that we have this real community of of people learning together. You're in several sections with other people, and so you you know you can really communicate. And uh, yes, I am trying to, in a way that I was not really able to do so as a directly as a university professor, to take everything that I've learned, everything that I've you know in my in my in my studies and in my traveling throughout the world and, you know, and to make that available to other people. I guess I've always conceived my, my main goal is, uh, I guess we're going to talk about language learning and the like, and, you know, it's, it's a long, hard slog. And uh, I guess I've always wanted to say, well, if there's anything, I, I do believe, I mean, everybody has to go through his or her own experience, but um, if you can get pointed in the right direction, you can save yourself a lot of time and trouble. And so uh, I guess my main goal is to make it easier for for other people, for younger people to do something akin to, to what I've done uh, and maybe just do it more effectively, more efficaciously, more efficiently, uh, you know, with, uh, uh, and, I, and I do feel like that is happening. It's very rewarding. Great. Well, let's pivot now a bit into the, into the meat of the interview here. You know, I thought we'd use the, your biography as the spine of it. Mm -hmm. And from there, you know, your, the two things I'd like to discuss with you, which are the development of your language learning approach and also, should we say the spiritual component, which, as I mentioned before, is, is a deep vein in your own in your own orientation. You've had monastic inclinations, Benedictine mm -hmm. in, fact, um, mm -hmm. in the past, as well as pseudo monastic phases. Um, mm -hmm. We'll we'll cover those. So I think we, if we could proceed that way, that would be very interesting indeed. Um, Certainly. No. Could you start off by giving us a sense of your background, your upbringing, and that that sort of context? Okay. Um, well, uh, I have a wonderful immediate family, parents who sort of fostered me to um, become the person I am without pushing me or, or doing anything that just provided all the uh, necessary elements to, to do things. Uh, if I'm all about being a scholar and, and, a, and a language person, I, you know, I get those directly from my own father. I grew up in a home that was full of books and all sorts of different languages and um, I've always been a, a a crack of dawn, early morning person has been my father. So when I would wake up, I would go and, and there would be this man sitting at the kitchen table babbling in, in some language with some grammar book in front of him. So the idea that it was um, possible, uh, able, I mean, there was never any doubt, you know, I just had the example right there that it is possible to teach yourself uh, large, large numbers of languages. Um, and then my mother um, made sure that that was somehow uh, actually put into practice and use, uh, because uh, throughout my youth, we we traveled a great deal. I was born in Chicago, but uh, we moved to Italy and then England when I was uh, uh, a little child, and then back to 
America. And for about 10 or 12 years, every summer, uh, we would travel abroad somewhere, mainly to Europe. But uh, I also went to Afghanistan right before the war there began. I spent a uh, long summer in India. Uh, I know you're uh, very interested in Tibetan Buddhism. I was in Ladakh. Uh, I think we were in the first busload of tourists uh, to, to go up there when that was open to tourism. Um, Morocco. So yeah, we, we, we traveled every summer. Uh, and my mother arranged for that, um, but um, my father was like the the, the interpreter. The, the, that's when he got to use his languages. So she would arrange for the places for us to go, be it in Europe or the Middle East or or Asia. And my father would uh, would communicate uh, with people. So I would see that being used. Um, and so, um, yes, I, I grew up uh, in, in that kind of environment, uh, lots of languages, lots of exposure to, to different cultures and different places. My parents... Um, uh, would uh, would reject the notion that they are hippies, but they're of that slightly older generation where they would be called beatniks and of the, the beatnik generation. And so um, I was exposed to um, to various um, uh, communes and and I don't know if you know what the living theater troupe is. They they lived right down the street from us when when I was a child, and it went to all sorts of fairs and, and demonstrations and uh, uh my uncle knew what's his name the the was the head of the Hari krishna movement and it, it, i went to his birthday party at george harrison's estate in, in, in england at some point it was a huge uh, to do so i had lots of exposure to all sorts of different uh, traditions and uh, basically just open-mindedness about uh various various traditions growing up so that's that's the kind of family that i come from and even though those were the waters you swam in actually mm -hmm. you didn't learn really any languages at that time in particular from what i understand your household was still fairly monolingual and your high school attempts at learning french were not particularly promising yeah, that's that 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 is true. My mother does not. Uh, she she's got you know foundation in a couple of languages, you know, but she's totally monolingual. So my father is uh, very scholarly about it. And um, my father had a twin brother uh, who um, apparently my grandfather encouraged them to be extremely competitive with each other and everything they did. Uh, and and they were until they were about fourteen years old, and then they realized they hated that, and they made a compact between them that they would divide the world up into spheres and not intrude on each other's spheres. So my father got languages and literature, and my uncle got music and religion and things like that. So um, they uh, they they each went and they did these uh, things separately themselves. But my father still always had this sort of competitive streak with my uncle and actually when i was younger he he did not encourage me to i mean i've 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 very much encouraged my sons i've tutored my sons in various languages i've tried to share everything i can with he didn't actively share his his languages with me and it was actually kind of competitive about it you know if i ever said anything in a foreign language he would misunderstand it and then say oh you mean this and then pronounce it a different way so it wasn't uh, wasn't particularly encouraging it wasn't until i got to college that yes that i felt sort of free out from under his wing that i could experiment and start learning languages on my own but what happened with french was um i with hindsight this is just my analysis of it is that uh, i had a teacher in what we call middle school intermediate school mm -hmm. between grade school and high school uh, so when I was 11, 12, 13 years old, I took French every year <clears throat> and I was a very good student. I got good grades in it. And so when I moved to another school district uh, in California, when I was 14, they saw that I'd had three years of French and they put me in the fourth year uh, because I'd done well in three years of French. But with hindsight, I think that my teacher, now I know how more about language teaching. I don't think he was teaching us much. I, don't, I think he was doing the same thing every year. I don't think I really learned anything. And in this new school district, um, they had learned stuff. So it truly was fourth year. And again, with hindsight, I don't know why I didn't go into an uh, a, 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 like third year or second year French or something, but um, that's something I was just not able to do. So I actually struggled with French for a little while uh, in, in high school. And um, then, you know, after I Kind of got the basics down. I, I did it. I enjoyed it. Um, but I don't know um, about the, the, you know, the, the American grading system. We have A, Bs, and Cs. A is the top note. Uh, I was always a paradigmatic straight A student in in pretty much everything. But I got occasional Bs in French, so it was not uh, it wasn't easy actually. So if your uncle had music and religion, was there any kind of overtly religious context you were ex exposed? It seems to a lot of counterculture. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, groups and, and various different types. Was there an overtly religious orientation in your family? Did you have any any leanings in that direction? Um, I'm thinking ahead of your testing your vocation as a Benedictine mm-hmm. monk, for example. Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering what what I don't know when that happened in your life, but I'm wondering mm-hmm. what paths led to that. Um, no, I would say that there was no particular leaning uh, in 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 my home. I mean, my parents were both there. My, you know, my my grandparents were you know all church going uh, Christians, but my parents, uh, I think, when they went to college, they they stopped that, and uh, you know, we didn't do that on any kind of regular systematic basis whatsoever. And yes, I was more exposed to probably to Hare Krishna temples than to Christian churches uh, when I was when I was growing up. Um, so no, I didn't have any uh, no no particular leaning. My my uncle he he became I don't know he he went through like every religious experience at a certain point and became sort of a new age type. Uh, sort of uh, talked about the Mayan the Mayan calendar and that was sort of his specialty. As a, he was a professor of art history for a while and he specialized in Mayan art and and did that and so uh, he. He studied many things, but um, I didn't, I wasn't particularly close to him. I didn't, you know, have a lot of interaction with him or my cousins growing up. It was just sort of a figure, you know, the, that we saw occasionally. Okay, well, let's go to college. So you go okay. to Columbia in 1982. Yes. Um, so what, let's let's go from there. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So um, one thing you should know about my family is that uh, I had uh, I had a younger brother. Um, so we were only two boys in, in my family, and uh, my younger brother Max he was um, perfectly normal until he was ten years old, and then he had a catastrophic brain disease, which left him terribly, terribly handicapped. Uh, and he, he lived for another forty years as a as, as a very invalid. Um, passed away a number of years ago. Um, and so when I was a teenager, that's why we stopped traveling. I mentioned that we, we traveled abroad every summer and for my youth. When I was 14 years old, he was 10. That's when he had it. Uh, and so we moved to California from New York because they had better rehabilitation facilities and treatment for stuff like that. So that's the, the reason we moved there. And um, that was just a really... Um, depressing event to have in one's life. And so uh, when I was a teenager, I was very um, inclined towards pessimistic philosophy, towards uh, reading Schopenhauer and Nietzsche and people like that. And um, I, that was my, you know, I, I didn't have a particular religious bent, but I was very, very, very interested in philosophy. And so, yes, when I, when I went off to college, my, my intention was to major in philosophy. And I remember having this, um, experience this this very simplistic thought now it seems to me it's like because it, it, it seems like the truth is just out there. there's just these threads that remain to be tied together why haven't people picked them up and tied them together i guess i would like to do that um but once i got there i found that philosophy was uh, 20th century philosophy is not um not greek philosophy and it's not 19th century german philosophy it's something totally different and that was the the the, the nature of the beast so i i didn't end up doing that I ended up double majoring in french and german but um, one reason I chose to go to Columbia, I really do think it's the, the best university we have uh, because it's got a two-year program. It's essentially great books. There's other things as well, but they, you know, they really thoroughly give everybody the same core foundation. And then you can choose a, a major of your, your own choice. And so uh, precisely the great books reading that we're doing right now in the Academy, it's not using the, the University of Chicago editions, but you know, very similar books. Um, we uh, read uh, numbers of things. And when we came to read first St. Augustine, um, and then St. Anselm, and then Thomas Aquinas, I was just blown away. I'd never read anything like that before. I'd never read any, you know, any real um, systematic theology or any, any, any sort of thought about, you know, true, you know, the nature of, of God or anything like that. It was just a totally new experience to me. And I didn't understand it. I didn't believe it. I didn't have any real faith, but there is one saying and something you have to believe in order to understand. And that made sense to me. I said, I want to see if I can force myself to believe. I really want to try to believe. I want to understand this. Um, and I had started, um, I don't know if you know New York City at all, but um, 
compared to, to Britain and, and Europe in general, it's everything is new, but there are lots of um, really beautiful, old, atmospheric, dark, chapel-like churches throughout the city. And particularly in the summer times, uh, I would have part-time jobs, you know, working in some office or something like this in different parts of the city. And it, at your lunch hour, you would be out and it would be this horrible, hot, hectic, you know, day atmosphere, very crowded and everything like that. And you just, pass, you could be passing by one of these churches and every so often the door would open and this cool, dark air would waft out with the smell of incense and candles. And it was so inviting. And I just, I would go in and it just was so beautiful and calm and peaceful that I just, I felt there's something here that I don't, that I, I'm, I'm blind to, I'm missing it. I, I really want to see it. Um, so uh, yeah, when I was, I guess, a, a junior in, in college, uh, so that would be put me about 20 years old, um, I started uh, attending the uh, 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 a Catholic church that was very near to the university. I started talking to a priest, very good friend of mine, became Father Michael Crimmins, um, and uh, was just aware of Thomas Merton. I'm sure you know who he is, Thomas Merton, uh, who had uh, been a student at Columbia some 50 years before that. Um, and so Father Crimmins uh, told me that, you know, he was in his church was it's called the church Notre Dame of the Grotto. It's 116th and, and, and Morningside Drive in New York City. But there's another church up about five blocks where Thomas Merton used to go. And he encouraged me to go there as well and just look at it. I, I preferred his church of, of, of the Grotto. Again, it was that sort of dark, stony atmosphere that was, you know, very, it was truly, it was carved out of a rock. It was, the, there's this bedrock of these giant granite stones. And this place was carved out of that night just loved the atmosphere. So um, yeah, I became a practicing Catholic at that point. And um, under his tutelage and guidance, Father Crimmins uh, started um, going to various monasteries uh, in, you know, in, in, in the neighborhood around uh, in New York State or in various places and just uh, seeing what, what they were like and just that scholarly monastic tradition of, of the Benedictines um, just inherently um, appealed to me. Um, and so when I finished college, um, I went off to a place not that far from where I am now in Minnesota um, that had a master's program in, in, in theology uh, and also was a Benedictine monastery and you could sort of like sort of have your foot in it and, and get your you know see if you had a vocation and look at that and, and study that as well um, and so I went off there um, and I had high I don't know high hopes or expectations or whatnot that started to unravel uh, when I got there because maybe it's superficial of me, but again, that, that atmosphere of those dark stone churches with candles and statues and incense that, that, that creates uh, something that the formal liturgy of a very traditional Latin mass has, has an incredible power. And in this place here in Minnesota was just kind of flat middle America. You know, it was it was a modern glass church. Uh, you know, everything was you know just very flat middle American. So it had none of none of that atmosphere, and I just uh, was um, kind of flabbergasted that it had sort of fallen flat. You know, this this incredible sort of conversion experience that I'd had just seemed to have evaporated, and then I left me wondering what 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 happened to me? What 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 is the experience of conversion? What does it mean? What, what am I doing? I don't, I don't know. I want to understand this. And so, um, although I had, uh, prior to this, um, I had, again, I'd already developed my love of languages. I double majored in, in French and German literature. I studied Latin and Greek and Sanskrit when I was in college uh, and uh, was probably more inclined to be kind of that direction. <clears throat> but this experience that I had just gone through um, made me um, be very curious about religion as such, the, the conversion experience and all that. So to kind of make sense of what happened to me, that's how I ended up at the University of Chicago and the Department of Comparative History of Religions to see how, um, how, yeah, to, to try to make sense of things. So um, that's where 
we, I went and I studied all the things that we're reading now in our, in our class in history of religions, Merce Eliade, the Romanian historian of religions and, and his books and things like that. And the, um, <clears throat> to try to make sense, I guess, of the conversion experience, that's, uh, I wrote my dissertation on, it's called, for your guru of Viking, it's called Viking Dreams, Mythological and Religious Dream Symbolism in the Old Norse Sagas, because in the Old Norse Sagas, the, uh, the, the Norse, the Icelanders, they were allowed to continue talking about their previous religion, their pagan religion, Thor and Odin and, and all those gods, for about 200 years after their official conversion to Christianity. They weren't allowed to speak about it openly, but if they said, oh, I had it in a dream, then they could write about it. And so uh, I ended up writing about that to explore all of these things. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Mm, that's fascinating. And was it, was it a moment, a conversion moment, or was it a gradual shift? And also, was there a moment of deconversion? And what se- so the, the, that's one set of questions. And then also, what sense did you end up making of it uh, as you examined it through the lens of the reading you were doing and studying you doing at University of Chicago? Oof, big questions, big questions. I would say it was more of a gradual shift. Again, just sort of coming from a modern, secular, humanist, contemporary background, and then becoming more and more um, enmeshed in this almost medieval um, tradition uh, that, you know, was just, you know, you can't just jump from one to the other, just sort of experiencing it more and more and seeing that there was um, a richness and a fulfillment there that seemed to be lacking uh, in the former. Um, so just finding that uh, more and more um, fulfilling. And then, like I said, just uh, somehow lacking that at, 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 uh, you know, at the place that I found myself in Minnesota. So again, there too, it's like, no, I, I didn't just get there and say, I hate it here, I'm leaving. You know, I, I stuck it out for, I think, nine months, you know, or something like that, to, you know, just to, to feel it go away. Um, and then... I'm not sure that I did make intellectual sense of uh, it through my studies. I just became aware of how complex everything was and sort of, again, uh, with with that same simplistic uh, mindset with which I had thought, oh, what, you know, why, you know, Nietzsche has got the idea and Schopenhauer, why doesn't somebody pick it up and tie the threads together with with a little bit of, of uh, Plato and Sophocles and then we'll have the truth. Um, I guess maybe I expected something similar to come as as an answer uh, when I went off to study comparative history of religions, but uh, then just realizing how many different traditions there have been, how many different uh, faith experiences there have been, how many different prophets, how many different uh, ways of understanding spirituality. It just became uh, sort of a moot thing to try to say, well, I want to understand what happened to me, but just sort of the exploration of the the width, the width and breadth of the the whole spectrum of spirituality sort of uh, became more more important than trying to just figure out what had happened to me. We'll get to the language learning shortly um, because that's another track in itself, quite a roller coaster. Uh, mm-hmm. That story is. While we're on this theme, do you consider yourself still to be uh, Catholic in that sense? Where do you find maybe maybe this is the wrong way to frame the question? Your own personal place in that great mystery tapestry Mm -hmm. all these different traditions all of them meaningful and and Mm -hmm. sacred in their own way and profound and and beautiful with different angles on on um on the mystery should we say Mm -hmm. where do you find yourself now in that i do go to mass on a weekly basis and i do go to confession and i get great satisfaction out of both of these ritual sacraments but i'll just confess to you and notice that what I confess in the confessions, I don't really believe this. I don't know what, I don't know what I believe. I can't, you know, in my heart of hearts say, you know, I, I believe this the way I believe something concrete that I can give, but just, I do find the, the, the rituals of, of the, the liturgies and the sacraments to be um, very nourishing for the soul. Um, but without being, um, you know, without sort of having that be my identity uh, or something like that, as it were. I think I've been too exposed, like I said, from um, 
my own background not being reared in any given tradition and then maybe i could talk about it now if, if we knew this here but again i mean i didn't um explore buddhism as you know as, as such like that too but when i was in korea i, I made you know stays at, at buddhist monasteries i did retreats there and i was very interested to learn uh, about Buddhism through Korean and translated some books of, of Korean story of, of Buddhist tales that were painted on the walls of one of the main temples there. And so I was very interested in that. And again, just sort of through my studies of, of comparative religion, just sort of, um, I'm afraid, I hope this doesn't sound wrong, but I think, I think I know too much to be, you know, just sort of to be real adherent of, of any one tradition in the way that somebody who was reared in that tradition and doesn't know something else and can be a truly, you know, sort of faithful practicing practitioner of it. So, I mean, I, you know, it's more that um, I, I uh, identify as Catholic in terms of, you know, where, where, where would I put myself, you know, how would I place myself rather than saying I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I'm Buddhist or atheist or something like that, but it's not, um, I, I don't have the the kind of belief that one should really have, I think, to be a really good Catholic. Well, that strikes me as a particularly Catholic thing to say. <laughs> if we're thinking about Thomas Merton, mm -hmm. uh, for example, um, the aspect of the mystery in Catholicism, that strain that's there, um, that almost anti-calcification, uh, there is that streak, I think, in, in certain aspects of Catholicism, and of course, many other traditions too, that, that perhaps strikes at the heart of the endeavor in a way that building one's identity around a certain set of beliefs and 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 so on, the statements of faith, etc., perhaps perhaps misses. The reason I refer to Thomas Merton is, as I'm sure you, you're aware, in his Asian journal, his last pos posthumously published, actually, his notes, um, he went to India and met with many religious teachers and uh, allegedly had planned to enter into a retreat under the guidance of some Tibetan lamas who he'd met and was very impressed by. And they were similarly impressed by him, actually, before his uh, unfortunate and untimely death. That um, extra extra tradition uh, roaming, I think that's, that's a very Catholic, that's a very Catholic thing, or it's a very <laughs> mystic thing. Maybe that's a better way of putting it. It's a very mm -hmm. mystic, trans-traditional. I think what I take from that um, is, again, I, I do think that... Um, in many ways, I was born to be a monk. Uh, I, have, like I mentioned before, I've I've always gotten up at the crack of dawn, and that's just a, I, I don't know. I just you know, if the sun goes down, I go down. I don't want to be up or do anything in the evening. I I get tired. I want to go to sleep, and then I just wake up at the crack of dawn, and that's always been the optimum time for me to cultivate the self to study languages or to pray or to meditate or to you know to to write or to do anything you know, if you got those if you wake up at it get started at two or three in the morning you've got you know four or five hours before anybody will bother you and so that's exactly the you know the you know monks get up and pray the liturgy and hours at two o'clock in the morning and so um even though i certainly didn't stay in that place in uh in in, in here in minnesota um once i sort of found my feet i don't know if you want to go through my biography if there are things, you know but when when i got to korea what i call my korean monastic phase not going off to buddhist monasteries but just really hunkering down and, and really studying on my own i very did consciously sort of follow a, a monastic schedule and routine of life and sort of um you know i guess you could I guess to really be a hermit, you have to be by yourself in the woods. I wasn't off by myself in the woods, but it was sort of a combination hermetic uh, or, or, or monastic life that I really led for about five or six years, being totally focused on, on one thing, that is language learning. Thank you. That's very fascinating. Let's talk about that. I wonder if you might run us from Columbia onwards. You went to Columbia, your PhD, at, you uh, received at University of Chicago, and then Correct. you're going to Berlin, et cetera, and then Korea and so on. I wonder if you might just take us through that period. And as you go, if you might just list the languages you picked up and studied in that period. Sure. So, yes, um, through high school, I I'd, I'd, I'd stopped with French and uh, I actually got something out of it at long last. 
Um, but when I got to college and I took a, a placement exam, I was only able to place into second year French. And that was sort of mind boggling to me because I'd had six years of it and I could read it and speak it and understand it to a certain degree. Um, but precisely because of my love of, of German philosophy, Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, I'd been wanting to study German. Uh, so I started studying German as a, as a college freshman. Um, and I just found that the the, the instruction of it was so much better uh, than my high school French had been. Likewise, my French class was much better then. So I just like had my eyes open to to good the fruits of good instruction. But I also felt that I was learning. Um, you know, after just one year of German, my German felt almost as good as my French. But although that had been a a good experience, I still kind of felt that it was slow. Uh, the, you know, it was a, the classes were good, small teachers are good, but the other students were not like as really revving to go for, for languages as I was. And I kind of felt held back by them. And so it just occurred to me, I wonder if I could, because I'd seen my father teaching himself languages, I wonder if I could teach myself a language better and more effectively than this. And uh, in New York City, it's basically a bilingual city with Spanish everywhere. So I said, let me see if I can teach myself Spanish. And um, lo and behold, I, I could. It was very easy and a painless experience to, to teach myself Spanish to a level that I considered equal to my French or German with you know, much less of the time and effort and whatnot. And that's, that really cemented me in my desire to, um, to keep learning languages and the idea that I could teach myself languages. But uh, I'd also been interested in, in Latin and, and Greek and later on Sanskrit there too. And I'd started studying these and I realized, oh, these are these older languages, these highly inflecting languages are much more complicated. This, this is good still to have in a classroom environment. And so I, I took French and German up to the level of reading literature very swiftly. So that was good. And uh, Latin, Greek, and then Sanskrit, I, I added and sort of had the initial goal before my sort of Catholic conversion, diversion of uh, trying to make myself a 19th century comparative philologist and, and learning more older languages. And then uh, at the University of Chicago, where I ended up studying, um, I guess I had an early declared interest in what I ended up writing in, in you know, sort of the, the medieval conversion experience of, of, of things. So um, I had a pronounced interest in reading medieval literature, so Old Norse, and I uh, had a whole sequence of courses in um, Old High German, Middle High German, Old English, a uh, whole sequence of courses in older Germanic languages, and also in, in medieval French. Uh, so I could use all of these ultimately to read comparative literature for my dissertation and kept Latin up as well. Um, but uh, I really wanted to learn more languages. And when I was in college, you know, we have a system where you have uh, what are called free electives. You can take other courses if you want. And my advisor there had been very accommodating. It's like, oh, you like languages? Sure, learn languages. You've got extra courses? Go ahead, do it. Whereas when I got to Chicago, um, I signed up for Persian. And my advisor called me into his office and said, I, I just noticed that you signed up for Persian. Why you signed up for Persian? And I said something silly, like, I'm, I'm curious about it. I want to learn lots of languages. I'm interested in it. He's like, no, no, no. You have to focus now. You have to narrow yourself down. You have to only, you, you're, you're working on medieval languages. You can't do this. If I had known that, if I had phrased that, like, well, I want to do comparative studies with Persian. I want to compare the, the Persian Alexander Romance with the French Alexander Romance. I could have gotten away with it. But um, I, I didn't have that experience. And uh, I had another advisor um, who did. Uh, and appreciate the, the, unfortunately, I think in modern academia, a lot of um, people don't have enthusiasm for languages. They see them as necessary evils. Um, you need to learn them in order to get at the text, but getting at the ideas in the text is what's important. And so you do what you have to, and you translate it. Good enough is good enough. You don't want to get excited about languages. Um, that's the general ethos. But I had one professor who uh, saw deeper than that, and he was happily encouraging me. Um, but then this is a long story too. Then, then he was murdered. He was assassinated. He was he was killed in in the University of Chicago, uh, in, in 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 the in the facility. So it's a Romanian exile, sort of a disciple of of Kulianu. And the going theory is that it must have been something political. But who knows? It was uh, very tragic. And 
shattering. Um, so with him gone in that general ethos and not being able, not, not also not having much time or discipline to do other things, when I was in the University of Chicago, I um, just conceived this desire to teach myself a whole bunch of languages someday. And I started collecting books and materials and getting this big, large collection of teach yourself books for all these different languages. And I said, someday I'm going to do this. Um, and uh, at Chicago, I was too busy to kind of finish my dissertation and do that. Uh, and then, yes, I was very fortunate after I uh, got my doctorate, I received a postdoctoral fellowship uh, to do research at the uh, Berlin Center for Advanced German and European Studies, which is a program run by the Berlin Senate to thank us Americans for having airlifted food to them back when they were being starved in, in the late 40s. And so um, every year they invite about 10 or 12 um, American scholars who are just finishing or just finished their doctorates to come to Germany and do research and make connections and, and further their careers in that way. Um, and so I got to go there to work on a research project that was uh, quite interesting on the um, sort of early, might be early New Age, early, early neo-paganism movement of the 1890s uh, uh, in sort of people trying to revive Wotanism or that kind of thing, um, and did some very interesting research in archives. But first and foremost was, hey, I studied German, and you know I've been reading it in a bookish way, and now I'm living in Germany. Let me see if I can really master the German language. And so I threw myself heart and soul into switching my brain to German. As soon as I knew that I was going there, when I got on the plane, I, I took English literally out of my brain, and I threw it away. And I said, go away. I'm not, I'm not thinking in you. I'm not speaking you. I'm only thinking German. I'm only using German for the next... I didn't know it would be two years, but I, I did that. So I concentrated very hard and worked uh, very hard on keeping my ear open all the time. And I found a native phon phonetician to help me with my pronunciation and just like noticed everything, wrote everything, I made a very conscious effort to master German. Um, and then my research grant allowed me to go around uh, and to other places and, and to um, do things in other countries. So I wasn't limited to Germany. I could do it in, in, in other countries as well. And I was invited to the University of Lund in Sweden to give um, a lecture there um, by some connections that I'd had. Uh, and when I got there, I never studied Swedish, but I understood it just fine. I couldn't speak it, but I understood it. And I was like, wow, what is this? And I realized well, I'm a native English speaker, and I've just made myself kind of a bilingual German speaker. And Swedish is a close cousin to both of these languages. I just wrote my dissertation. I just I spent two years reading Old Norse literature. Old Norse is the mother of Swedish. And so this is just, and I, I studied the whole slew of branches of Germanic languages. It's all the older Germanic languages. I know, I'm a comparative philologist. I know how languages grow and develop. I know how they're related. I've got an intuitive sense for all of this. And so Swedish was just there. And so I said to myself, well, let me see if I can learn how to speak it fast. Uh, and so I sort of, I'd just been invited to give a lecture there and could have gone back, but I just had free time and stuff. So I, I spent a couple of weeks um, traveling around Sweden, studying Swedish, speaking to Swedes. I went up, way up north and uh, did a monastic thing, stayed in a cabin in the, in the polar circle for about four days, just hunkered down and came back to Lund eventually about two weeks later. And, and I saw people's jaws drop because I was having you know full, meaningful conversations with them after two weeks when I couldn't speak before. Um, so I repeated that experience with Swedish. We, I did that with um, with Dutch and with Italian, and uh, I had lots of opportunities to to travel around to other places. I got very interested in European minority languages, things like Frisian uh, and Retro-Romanche and uh, Occitan. I tried to sort of track these things down, go to these these areas, and. Um, find people that had organizations, institutions to promote these minority languages and sort of did intensive, intensive courses with all this. And I was just sort of having the time of my life, really, uh, just sort of wakening up, you know, getting the fruits of all my philological studies and, you know, on the strength of my Latin and French and Spanish, Italian was just there. You know, just the same way, you know, and the strength of my German and Norse and, and stuff, Swedish was just there. So um, it was great fun, but it was really too easy. And I just got the idea, 
I'd like a real challenge. I want to know if I'm really, I feel, I seem to be really good at this. I'd, I'd like to, you know, if I am good, let me learn something really hard rather than just doing one easy thing after another thing. Let me send, learn something really hard to see if I can, I can do that. Um, and so I just literally did some research investigation and looked for a language that um, had a rich cultural tradition that hadn't been explored all that much, uh, that was very difficult. And I just got the, I want to, I said, I want to go to a totally different culture, a totally different environment, learn the language well, and then learn the culture through the language. And through some research, I just hit upon the idea that Korean is in the category of the most difficult languages for a native English speaker to learn uh, hasn't been explored as much as Japanese or Chinese and uh, just worked out that way. So that's how I ended up uh, in Korea, devoted um, to the study of Korean. And then shall I just keep going on? That's 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 the place where I really hit my stride. That's my monastic period. Or do you want to ask me a question or something in between? Yeah, let me ask you a question about that. So what you've described there is an awareness of of the of branches of languages of course an awareness of them conceptually is one thing but because of your deep study in in enough of the um, older and modern languages of those branches you found you were able to move into those other languages and i've heard you say almost like a dialect they're almost like dialects of each other rather than new languages someone learns mm -hmm. uh, you know so that's uh, that's very interesting. I'm what, I wonder if you might say something a bit about that. This um, compounding effect, it seems, of 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 language learning in your case, but also something that's often said is that it's a cliche. If you learn a new language, you learn a new way of seeing the world. Right? This is a cliche that that, that is the, the case. I'm wondering what happens when you begin to contact an entire branch. And what about identity? I've also heard people say who speak several languages. Oh, I have you know my Italian personality and I have my French personality, and there's a bit is a bit different uh, when I'm using my Tibetan or whatever the case is. I've heard people say that. So, what happens in, with identity when you're immersed at the branch level? First of all, I, I I wouldn't say that I've got different personalities in different languages per se. Uh, what is different, um, for example? I wouldn't call it my Swedish personality, but I'm obviously somewhat uh, retiring and, and bookish, and I'm not the kind of person to go up and start talking to strangers on the train most of the time. But when I was in Sweden, I had like, you know, some very limited time, a couple of weeks to try to speak Swedish with people. I just developed this outgoing gregarious personality so that I would have the occasion to, to speak. Uh, and I think when people say they have different personalities, it's something like that. It's it's taking advantage of being in a new situation, or often it's the um, the limits on your vocabulary, the limits on your expression, so you feel like you're you're doing things different. But uh, I would not feel like I have fundamentally different personalities in different languages uh, per se. Um, but um, what was the gist of your question? Identity on 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 the branch level. Um, hmm. So, so yes, I mean, my, my experience is that um, I think any Swedish person would say that, you know, learning, say, Dutch is uh, easier than learning Portuguese or, or Tibetan or Korean, God forbid, but it's still a different language to, you know, to somebody who's Swedish or Norwegian, uh, learning Afrikaans. These are different languages. They're different systems. They've got different grammar. They've got different vocabulary. They've got different rules. Um, to their sensory perception, they're different languages. And yes, through my studies, my protracted in-depth studies, I kind of feel like I broke down those barriers. And so, yes, I experienced them. I wouldn't even say dialects so much as variations on a theme. You're a musician, you play music, and you know how that is. We have Box Goldberg variations, or Marin Marais uh, wrote Les Folies d'Espagne for flute, or um, all sorts of musical variations where you have a basic theme, and then you have, you know, 15, 20 different variations on it. And if you first just hear one of these variations, you might not notice that it's the same theme, but if you know the theme, then you know uh, that it is. And I guess that's what I feel like I have um, 
through long years of hard study, have acquired the, the ability to do that with both the Germanic family and the Romance family. So these two, two families have got enough foundation in them to, to really feel that. So, you know, I would say that, you know, to me, uh, there aren't very many languages in either of these families that I haven't studied yet, but one, and if there are any, you know, it wouldn't, getting the ability to to go there, to speak them, to do them would be something that would not be require a, a learning process for me. It would be an awakening process. It would be a going there and, and, and sort of bringing it to life process. Um, whereas learning, you know, a different language that I have no foundation in Hungarian, say that would involve the same learning process for, for me as for for, for anybody. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do feel like um, I have broken down those barriers between these variations on the theme so that I can hear the variations on the theme and perceive them as such. And I also feel like um, I know that I've done this with these two large branches, these two families, the Romance family and Germanic family, and I have enough foundation, enough insight to know that the same thing could easily be done, say, with um, you mentioned Sanskrit uh, with with the Indic languages, with with Sanskrit and Hindi and Bengali. If you had enough Indic languages, historical Indic languages, I'm sure you could do the same thing. You do the same thing with the Slavic languages, maybe with the Celtic languages. So, um, with other, I I, I I I can conceptualize that there are other branches out there where if one put in enough foundational time, one would be able to access far more than one had actually studied. So I suppose this is why it's difficult to answer this sort of question. How many languages do you speak? That's, yep. you know, th yeah. yeah, at this point, uh, how could you answer that? Uh, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. I, I honestly don't know how to answer that question. Yep. You know, I, I don't mean to be evasive when I say things like too many and too few or, or something like that, but it would be disingenuous for me to say, okay, I'm going to count. Well, Swedish is one, Danish is two, Norwegian is three. To me, they're all the same. I know they're different. You know, they have different grammar. You can do different things, you know. And, you know, what do I do with languages that I almost, I, I call them get in the bargain. You know, you learn, you get them for free. You know, there are languages that, um, you know, that, that I, I barely studied. But I, you know, if they're in one of these branches, you know, I, 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 can, I can read them. Give me a book in it. It's not a hard thing. You know, I could, I can speak them. I've done that. You go and you speak and, you know, and you open your ears and in a couple of days you can be speaking. So there are languages in these families that I feel like I actually know them, even though I've hardened said them all. And then on the other hand, there are languages that I love dearly that I have studied for years and years and years um, that um, I can also read and I've got a solid foundation in, but um, I've never had the opportunity to speak them. And when I try to do it myself, I get tongue tied and I know that I would need a lot more exposure there. So, you know, I've done a lot more studying of, of Persian, say, than of Catalan. Okay. And I do have a very solid foundation in Persian. I can read a lot and I can understand a lot and stuff like that. But if, if you know, I would... To go to Tehran, I would need, you know, a month or a couple of weeks at least to, to be on my feet. But if I were to, you know, go to, I don't know if I still speak Catalan so much in Barcelona, but a small town around there, you know, I'd, I'd probably be on my own in, in a day or two. Um, so it's a, it's a question like that. So it's really, really hard to answer. You know, you have languages that you've studied a great deal and you know, have a solid foundation and you know a lot, but the degree to which they're really different and, and difficult, um, you would say that, you know, you, you, yeah, it's, it's, it's just a different ballgame. You know, even even within the, the scope of Russian, I have among the Slavic languages, I've got pretty well. And if I were to compare Russian, say, to, I don't know, um, something more exotic, something with a totally different culture, you know, like even, you know, if I, you know, for all the time I spent in Korea, I could go, I could wake my Korean up, but I would need to spend a number of years more to like really go up another notch. Whereas if I were to go to, you know, live in Russia, I would sort of go up quite quickly. There's a different set of, of learning curves that are involved. So um, yeah, it's a really, really hard question to, to answer. Um, I feel like, I don't know, again, not to evade it, but uh, we'll get to this part of my story, I guess. I mean, I, I spent so much of my life just totally focused on learning languages. And I don't really think that it's surprising that I know as much as I do. And I'm actually, without regretting it, I regret how 
sort of one-sided I let my life become at a certain time. And I kind of wish that I had done, uh, given that I can't take all my languages to higher levels and I can't uh, develop them, and I don't, I don't want to consider it uh, that I wasted time on that. But um, given how many other things there are to do in, in, in this life, and it's a short life, and, and maybe, uh, you know, we're, we're just, you know, I, I just kind of wish that I'd, I'd done more other things. One more question on, uh, on this before we move to Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, so part of the motivation in, in those very early days of, of studying, say, German was you could read Nietzsche and Schopenhauer and so on in their own, in their own words. Have you found, um, well, in those cases, did you find that that, that actually happened? Did you get a, a deeper and better understanding of those, of those figures? Um, and also Germanic romance, these branches are not just linguistic. They're also, there's a deep or complex cultural surround. Uh, that goes along with these, and indeed in the ways in which these different um, offshoots interact and differ and are similar, etc. There, there's a lot of implication there. So I'm wondering if you found anything unsurprising or interesting in terms of contacting that cultural stream that's embedded in the language or at least connected to the language uh, when you got to that branch level. Yes, absolutely. Learning how to read well in these languages is very, very much worth it. Very, it's, there's no, it, you can't compare reading translations of, I, I think if something is well written, you know, either in terms of the, um, you know, if, it's, if somebody has some ideas that are worth expressing, and particularly if they took an artistic way, like a, a, an author of, of, of work of literature or, you know, or a work of philosophy who's, you know, really trying to express some ideas, um, it, loses something in translation definitely always and so if you have something that you admire and you enjoy reading uh, it's it's always worth learning how to read it in the original i've not have no no regrets about that whatsoever so um if i have any regrets in terms of learning things that's a, if I, I haven't read enough english in my life I've, I've spent too much of my life reading other languages i've probably literally read more <clears throat> german or french literature in my life than i've read English literature. Um, so you, you can't read everything, but um, there's, you know, there's a, a, a real sense of um, truly, as you just said, it's not just a question of, oh, I'm enjoying the ideas more, but yes, you start to immerse yourself in another cultural tradition, another, you know, set of links, just like we're doing in the great books, you know, where um, Herodotus leads to Thucydides, you know, and these kind of things, you know, you, when you start reading, you know, there, there are links in a chain that you didn't know that were there. So you can see uh, other things and one thing leads to another and you want to get more and more immersed in it in a different way of thought and a way of culture. So um, <clears throat> I very much um, enjoyed time in, in, in Germany. And uh, it sort of stuck with me more again, because I, I, I converted my mind to it. I mean, for um, I still well, now I tend to write my, my, my diary, my journal in, in, in Latin, but uh, I've, I've written in German ever since I just, you know, just and, and for about uh, five or six years after I left Germany, I would still say that was my operating system, my brain would just, you know, revert to that. So, uh, and I, I mean, I still, we've talked about, you know, what I've talked about, what I call linguistic meditation and stuff like that, consciously shifting your brain. I mean, I, I do consciously put my brain into various languages at various times, um, but I also find myself uh, quite often just spontaneously thinking in, in the languages that I've read the most in. So French and, and German and Latin and Spanish, that my brain is truly multilingual in that sense. So accessing those, those different strands. Well, in 1996, you secured a posting at Handong Global University in Korea, uh, South Korea. And mm -hmm. you write about that time. When I was between the ages of 32 and 37, I led a monastic existence, obsessively studying languages all day, every day. Of my 18 waking hours, I often managed to devote 16 to linguistic pursuits throughout this period. So let's let's go to Korea. Can you tell us now about this time? Sure. Um, yeah, that was also the time of my life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I guess I've had a pretty good life. I've uh, several times that I can look back on and uh, with with great fondness. Um, so Korea was um, 
the occasion was to immerse myself in the Korean language, teach myself Korean, which I knew nothing of when I set out on that odyssey. Um, again, I, I chose it based on um, um, survey done by uh, the, the United States Government Training Institute for Languages, uh, where they rank languages by how long it takes them to train um, servicemen and, and diplomats in these various languages. And they have the East Asian languages, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and Arabic, and this highest, most difficult quality level that's supposed to take you some, you know, the longest amount of time to become basically functional in them. And, and uh, Korean, again, I, I chose it because it had been less explored than Chinese or, or Japanese. And there weren't many good resources for it at that time. And I really didn't know anything about it. And knew nothing about the culture or the language. And so um, I did uh, have my work cut out for me uh, when I when I got there. But um, I that position that I got um, uh, was a, a truly a dream position. Um, I, you know, I talk about having a guiding guardian angel or somebody holding your hand over me. I, I got that position by writing, which now I know to be, the, now I know how universities work. It's it's a miracle, a miracle that I got any answer. I wrote the most quixotic, quixotic letter in the world. When I was in Germany, I went to the Korean embassy. I got a list of all the Korean universities. I wrote a letter. I sent it to every single one. I said, hi, I'm me. Um, I would like to teach um, French, German, and, and, and Spanish, and, and or other languages too, if, if you have them, and I want my research to be learning Korean. If you'd like to have somebody like me come to your university, write back, and this place <laughs> wrote back. One place out of all the universities in, in Korea um, wrote back, and that's exactly what they wanted. They had a Department of International Studies, Language and Literatures, where they had, uh, it was an English language university, and they had a second foreign language requirement. And so every student in this department had to learn French, German, Spanish, or later on Chinese or Japanese. And it was a brand new university, been founded the year before. They didn't have faculty. So having one person who could teach three languages was, was a godsend for them. It's exactly what they wanted. And um, they wanted to be a, a, a global university, an international university. They wanted to have foreign faculty. But they didn't really want foreign faculty. They didn't want you involved in the decision-making process or whatnot. And so um, most of the foreign faculty that went there, they, they hated that. They resented being shut out of everything, not having any voice and say a decision. And they left after a while. But I turned that on its head and I said, no administrative duties, nothing else. I just get to teach my languages and, you know, and learn and study. And so that's what I got to do. So I used my time in my office to either be teaching French, German, Spanish, um, start those programs from, from the ground up and, and get students reading literature in these languages and or to be studying Korean with the help of students. I had a very, made a very good friend there, uh, Kim Jong-nok, who wrote several books together about Korean. He was right next door to me as a Korean linguist. Uh, so my, my office time was devoted to learning Korean and then later on learning added classical Chinese to that, because you need that for the etymology and uh, Chinese and Japanese. So East Asian languages studying in my office and, you know, professionally doing that. So I kind of count that in my linguistic time. But when I say that I got up to 16 hours in a day, what I'm really thinking back with fond memories of are, are non-work days, weekends and, you know, time off or something like that when I my time was completely my own. Uh, and I could structure my day, like I said, just waking up <clears throat> uh, at the hours of the morning uh, and setting to work in a very, very disciplined fashion, um, studying and uh, trying to learn as many languages as I could, as well as I could in the most systematic and efficient fashion that I could possibly devise. So I mentioned that I had um, already back in Chicago started collecting books and materials for learning languages. I, I continued collecting when I was in Germany and I took this collection with me to Korea and in Korea, uh, again, I was uh, found myself being paid pretty well and uh, not having any expenses. And so I used my money to, to buy more materials. And so I, I really went about assembling the widest collection of, of, of language learning materials um, that I could possibly get my hands on. And when I got my hands on them, I just said, I want to see if I, I'm just, I, I, I want to learn something from every branch something uh, i'd like to try to learn 
you know, a, a, a Bantu language. Uh, I'd like to learn a Dravidian language. I'd like to learn, you know, I want to get something out of, you know, see, see, you know, as many different kinds of languages to see how they work, how they're different, how they, how they fit together. And so I did some exploration like that. And then uh, there's too many different types of languages. I could never have gotten there anyway. And I realized by exploring that, you know, some of them were, you know, too, too, there wasn't enough for me to go further with either in terms of materials that I had or innate interests that I felt for other things, but other languages, once I started studying, I just fell in love with them and I was just fascinated by them. And I wanted to get, you know, as much as, as I could with them and, and as rich as I could. So, um, yeah, I just structured my day around going through my language resource library, taking down all sorts of materials and, and getting started with um, methodology by saying, well, how, how much time do I need uh, to devote to learning a language if I do it on a regular systematic basis? If I, if I do this every single day at the same time, you know, in a monastic fashion, like as a, as a ritual, as a rite, um, how many different languages can I study? How much time do I need to give to it? And I discovered that um, in the sort of the initial learning phase, uh, if you go at something very systematically every single day, uh, you can basically break it into about a 15 minute time chunk uh, and, and, you know, and make progress, you know, slow progress over time. Um, and so I kind of went through at a certain point, I was trying to study all the, 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 so the branches of the Celtic language. So I was trying to do Welsh and Irish and Breton at the same time. I was trying to do all the Slavic languages that I get my hands on. I was trying to do all the Indic languages. I was trying to do uh, Persian and Turkish and Swahili and, uh, uh, and, and all these languages. Um, and uh, again, just discovered that um, I got really good at learning the basics of a language. I got really good at learning how to read a textbook. I got really good at mastering the materials. Uh, and so going from ground zero to having a solid foundation was something that since I had, you know, those five or six years to, to do that in, it's something I could take that up. But then I hit several walls and one of them was like, okay, well, if I go from here to here, what's the next stage? And, we'll kind of, and it takes more and more time. And then when you come, I'm not looking at a textbook anymore. I want to look at a novel now. I want to look at a work of philosophy. I mean, that requires a lot of time to, to read. Uh, and so I just realized that I'd kind of studied too many languages to, to take a number of them to, uh, to further and a higher degree. And so I kind of had to um, look back and say, okay, I'm going to just work on these now, try to develop a schedule for juggling them and, and the like. But yeah, I just, uh, even in that time though, I mean, I just, you know, when I started, I started cutting down on the number of languages, but devoting more time in terms of the hours to them. But uh, I had zero problem on a day when I didn't work, I had zero problem waking up at about two in the morning, um, sitting down and uh, studying in about 15 minute, 20 minute time chunks for initial learning, or there may be longer, half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour when I was going to a higher level. Uh, I would study a variety of languages. Then I would, uh, when the sun started coming up, I would go for a, a long run. It's always been important to me, you know, just taking that. And, and uh, I would take the we haven't talked about methodology. I mean, I'd, I'd been shadowing these materials. I just listening and speaking simultaneously with them. Uh, I would take tapes of material that I had thoroughly shadowed uh, with me when I went on these long cross-country runs um, and uh, listen to those. And then when I came back, uh, I would just uh, keep studying um, all day. And I really had uh, the experience that... Um, when you try to study too much of one thing, um, you, your brain can kind of get on overload and you, you burn out and you get fuzzy and you can't focus anymore. Um, but when you are switching from different things to different things, the process of switching itself and seeing connections, you're doing it in a comparative fashion, and you, you are taking little breaks, you know, stretching and you know, getting up and doing something yoga-like to, you know, get your your, your blood going. Um, that uh, I had no problem just doing this until pretty much close to bedtime. Fascinating. And that went on mm -hmm. for, like you said, five or six years. Mm -hmm. I guess 1996 to about 2000, 2001. Um, and then my life became more of a normal real life. That's uh, when I met my 
Jung Kyung, who became my wife, and uh, we got married and um, had a child and then another child. And so, you know, life became a bit more uh, complicated and, and demanding. And it just sort of moved on to that phase. So on the one hand, um, having more like a, a human connection uh, and, and, and doing other things. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, just realizing that, you know, what what languages have I taken up to, to this level? So, um, I, yeah, by, by the end of that time, I kind of realized that there's no point in my learning any new languages anymore. There's no point. I've, 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 I would love you. You're, I'd love to know Tibetan like you do, but you know, where, where am I going to put it? How am I going to put it somewhere in this? Um, I kind of realized that, um, you know, I, I bitten off more than I could chew and I needed to prune back, abort some, you know, abandon some so that I could take others to uh, a higher degree of, of reading literature and and things in them uh and then that was also my kind of regret that um in that five or six years which i, I very very much enjoyed um but spent all of my time learning and studying new languages and other things i didn't spend enough time reading literature i didn't spend enough time you know sort of enjoying the languages that i knew already and that that seemed um not right uh and then yeah then then you know, there are languages and there are other languages. And so there's, for example, Sanskrit, which is so incredibly rich that you, you know, you need to really devote time to continuously studying and using that. And I got those foundations in college, not use them so much in graduate school. And when in that Korean monastic period, when I turned my energies to something like Sanskrit, it was like, that's so rich and fulfilling. These other sort of modern smoke and vernaculars are 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 nice and everything but they're not the same as this deep rich you know spiritual and literary tradition and i haven't given enough time to this and so i kind of felt like i needed to devote more time to long rich deep traditions um i took uh among the languages that I selected out for, you know, taking up to further improvement, I did, I did take Russian and I went and I did a homestay in Russia and I tried to um, improve my ability to, to read that and get up the ability to reading Dostoevsky in the original. That was my motivation. I wanted to read Dostoevsky in the original. And then when I got to be able to read Dostoevsky in the original, I found that I didn't like Dostoevsky anymore. Dostoevsky was my depressed teenager, but I liked Turgenev. I liked others. So it was worthwhile. Um, but uh, yeah, I, 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 after I got married, I kind of figured when I got married, my wife, like many Koreans, could um, probably pass a, uh, a, an, an English grammar exam quite well, um, but couldn't speak a word. And in Korea, we just spoke Korean all the time. So I figured we would, um, I'd be able to speak Korean forever. So I didn't need to stay there anymore. I could leave after about nine years and go on to the next challenge, which was Arabic, because I went among all the languages and what's a really rich tradition and has this, it's still hard and demanding. And uh, I chose Arabic. And so uh, we moved on to, to Lebanon, where I could uh, focus on, on Arabic there. Uh, and uh, that was another wonderful time uh, that was unfortunately and sadly, tragically cut short by the the war in 2006 that uh, sort of drove us out, um, but uh, I, I really uh, was was immersed uh, in, in Arabic at that time, and that was sort of a, a new level of moving on from being, you know, really very widespread, studying lots of things, to going to a new place and being immersed in a new thing. So that was another stage. So, but I feel like I'm talking too much. You should ask me some questions before I just say some things. All right. Yeah. Well, there is one, two questions I have really. Number one. It's uh, what inspired your uh, attending the Buddhist meditation retreats in Korea, and how was that experience? So, I mean, yes, as I said, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd gone to Korea to learn the culture through the language. The first step was learn the language and then learn the culture. And so uh, the place where I was was not in Seoul, the capital city. It was on the West Coast, but it was quite new, near to um, this the old imperial capital city of Gyeongju, where there were all these wonderful historical um, museums and monuments and, and things like that. But the kind of most atmospheric places that you can go to are these monasteries that were sort of, you know, it's a very beautiful mountainous country and beautiful, beautiful monasteries, you know, up on by these waterfalls and these things. And so just in exploring the culture, 
that just hit you right away is that, you know, the nicest places to see. And again, sort of variation upon a theme, the, um, the, you know, the same sort of feel of being in an otherworldly place as being in, you know, in, 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 in a dark uh, chapel, like uh, church with incense and candles, you could get something a similar type feeling in, in, in some of these, some of these monasteries. And so um, just, um, traveling about, you know, to get interested in the culture and see what was there. Um, I went to various places and there is one place called Hay Insa, which I think is a UNESCO historical site. And they have the world's oldest books there. They're wooden blocks that have been carved and they're sort of um, uh, an almost open air preservation system. So they don't dry out. And so it's just this incredible, um, I've seen this. These are the oldest printed books in the world, and they're here. And there's this whole Buddhist canon and all these kind of things. And um, yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, I don't know if you've been to a, a Korean Buddhist monastery. I mean, these larger ones, it's it's not just one building, it's an entire mountain that's taken over with all these little chapels and like, and that, that sound of tok, 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 and, and hearing these things. It was just very inviting, um, inviting way of. A being and just sort of, you know, looking at, you know, seeing the, the monks, you know, sort of praying or meditating and just wanting to do something similar, know, know what they were all about. I mean, I'd, after my language got better, I tried to uh, learn how to play a, a Korean flute, traditional Korean flute with a traditional Korean flute master. I tried doing calligraphy with a, another Korean uh, teacher. Man. It was just natural to try to go and, and learn something like that. And so um, at this place, Hei Insa, um, that's where uh, they had these wonderful murals, uh, all the giant wall murals, and they had a book of of um, tales that are you know telling the tales of these. I guess they're Jataka tales, or they're, they're they're something. And I just thought, wow, that that would be kind of interesting and neat. You know, I'd like to translate this, and so I I conceived the idea of wanting to translate that book, and it seemed to me it behooved me to really get into the atmosphere of being in that place and, and going and staying and and trying to do that. But um, yeah, so I, I, when I found out that they had, you know, retreats like that, I, I just wanted to to try it and to do that. Um, all in all, that those were good, one, yeah, very, very enriching experiences. But I just, I don't know, when I think of that, that I did... I, to this day, I, I just I'm mortified by you know my my ignorance going into that. I the way, the number of times that I know I must have broken um, protocol or, or done something. I remember what the first time I, I I didn't know you're not supposed to you know you have to eat every grain of rice on your on your plate. You don't waste anything. You don't throw anything. I just you know, like took half my tray and put it back. You know, here's this 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 foreigner this you know this this guy here and he's just like throwing our food away and nobody said anything but um when i think back on it i i'm, I'm a, I, I cringe a little bit to think about how many things i probably did did wrong and what did it involve a lot of meditation seated meditation uh, and cross-legged and so on um yeah but i mean they didn't really give any uh, specific instruction to you know how to do that it was just sort of like this is what we're doing and and you can try to sit down and do it too with us and so not you know i i did you know i tried but you know i didn't you know um it wasn't uh, it wasn't that i don't think the kind of retreat that you lead where you're kind of like specifically in instructing there was just sort of this presupposition that you would somehow know uh, what to to do with that so yes i mean it was i did spend you know time you know sitting with them and and, and trying to um to stay in my mind uh, silent among them but like i said it wasn't um it, it wasn't like a guided meditation retreat okay then my second question before we leave korea and i know we're coming right you know coming towards the end of our time is you said you really in a way were born a monk and or born monastic the inclined and you you're in this monastic period one one of your uh, one of the times of your life you've described how on earth did your now wife manage to uh, we, how could we say coerce you i don't know if that's the right word um invite you um out <laughs> of of this of this kind of uh, almost vocation that uh, that you you were in i don't know um she she was a uh, she was in the law school. I was in the, the school of international studies, languages, and literatures, and she was uh, just a 
Um, the uh, every school there, or I guess you would call them college or department, had um, its administrative assistant or or or, or you know somebody who you know facilitated everything in the school and she did that in the law school and there was another uh lady who did that in in, in my college and these you know there were like eight colleges and so these eight assistants had you know like a group among themselves and um i guess she was interested in me she told my assistants you know that uh i don't know we wanted to have lunch together so the three of us had lunch together and then the two of us had lunch together and we sort of just hit it off and clicked. Uh, Koreans have a tremendous amount of respect for scholarship and for, you know, that that was one of the nicest things about being a, a professor in Korea, just the, you know, just the amount of respect you get from your students and society as a whole. Uh, and so um, she just really appreciated my, my studiousness and my scholarship and uh, understood, you know, that I wanted to, you know, if we didn't stay there, that I wanted to go to other countries and he was fine with that, wanted to see the world and travel and uh, just sort of, uh, yeah, I don't know. It, 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 it wasn't, um, she didn't work any specific magic. I don't, I don't know. It just it's a sort of, uh, I think there's a time in life for things to happen. And yes, I, I, I hadn't imagined that I would get married. I hadn't imagined, I didn't have any particular desire to get married and have a family or have a child or something like that. And I kind of thought that, okay, that's, that's passed me by, you know, and then bam, then there she was. Well, this has been such a fascinating discussion. You know, I might have to petition you for a sequel mm -hmm. because uh, we're about not even a halfway through the thing, like the sort of things I'd like to ask you about. Uh, you went, as you say, to Beirut in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes. you, went to, you spent some years in Singapore. You spent yes. some years in Dubai. Yes. And all of this, I think, rich, um, re these rich periods um, and lots to talk about there. Also, we haven't really touched your methodologies. Uh, you have various interesting techniques. You've mentioned shadowing, a kind of um, uh, speaking along with um, recordings and so on. But you have a lot of other interesting, other interesting techniques too, scriptorium, a kind mm -hmm. of almost sacred copying or an, almost a meditate, a writing meditation, really, in a sense. Um, that's a fascinating uh, technique. And you also have various different techniques of breath control and uh, turning the mind in different directions, switching certain things off in the mind, switching certain things on um, that you've developed. In, and I think we can see where you've developed them through this whole process here. I'd love to uh, go through those processes. It's, it's sort of language learning and study as meditation, uh, uh, as a path Absolutely. of meditation. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That's why I call it the path of the polyglot. Yeah. 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 No, I'd be, I'd be happy to, to do that. We've been on for like, what, 90 minutes. Uh, almost, I don't know how long your podcasts usually are, but uh, maybe people need a break after a bit. If they're interested, I'd be happy to come back. Yeah. Well, oh, great. Well, then we'll do that uh, with a focus on those areas. Could you say um, perhaps the last couple of words about, about the Academy and what you've got coming up in particular? I understand you're starting Tacitus. Uh, who's Tacitus? And I understand you're also starting a Sanskrit course. Maybe you can just throw out a few of the courses you're doing. You've got discussion groups in the languages, your German discussion, you know, reading German literature, re discussing it in German. You're teaching various different medieval languages. Maybe you could give just a, just a smattering now. We've got this context of your background, a smattering okay. of the sort of what's going on in the academy, particularly what's coming up new. Great. Well, it's for the Steve Jameses of this world. Uh, so <laughs> trying to offer offer everything that I've learned and become to the degree that I can. And I think that I had some basic ideas of what I wanted to offer. And then um, when people ask for certain things or express interest, uh, we, we open that up. And so, um, yeah, I mean, with my background in medieval languages, I've got, uh, there's, as you said, there's very, there's small circles. We've got people reading um, Chrétien de Troyes, the medieval Arthurian romances in medieval French. There's another group reading Nibelungenlied in, in Middle High German. Uh, there's a group learning uh, old to read the Old Norse sagas. Um, uh, uh, several circles for reading German literature. We're reading a contemporary novel, uh, novelist, modern fantastic novelist, Walter Moos. Another group is reading Goethe and Schiller. Uh, we have French reading circle. We're reading a novel by Zola, Spanish circle. We're reading a modern novel by a Spanish uh, Argentinian author, uh, Ernesto Sabato. 
So yes, in, in, in those languages, we have various things. Latin, I've got several circles. You're in the, what we call guided self-study, where I'm not teaching you, but you're teaching yourself. And I'm just sort of, you know, guiding you along as you do that. I have a Latin conversational circle where we speak Latin. Uh, and then there's a sort of intermediate area where we've got some Latin drills going on for people with a foundation, but who need more. Um, Similarly, people expressed interest in Arabic. Uh, and so I've got a small circle of people who are learning to read classical Arabic. And then you and a couple other people said that you would be uh, interested in Sanskrit. And so if there's enough interest in that to open up uh, a group to do that, where um, I would really like to get people started off, I think lots of languages, um, unfortunately, uh, when they're exotic and have a different script, people start out by um, using a Romanized script as, as sort of a crutch, and then they never throw that crutch away. And so you mentioned my technique of scriptorium. What I, my, my first goal with our group, if we can get Sanskrit going, would be to get people to really learn the, the, the Devanagari alphabet in and of itself without reference to you know, any kind of ABCs and getting that writing and getting people writing nicely and doing that. Um, and Sanskrit is a language that... Um, it's traditionally just been read and analyzed, and that's what I think people would like to do. You know, to go into some some sacred texts, some some you know something, or you know some some classical texts, and begin to tease things out. But it would be interesting to uh, learn how to try to speak it as well. And so we might want to try to explore that to, together as a group. Um, beyond that, again, with with people's interest to. Uh, with my background in comparative history of religions, we've got, you're in the, the course, we're reading uh, Marcia Iliada's um, History of Religious Ideas and discussing that systematically chapter by chapter. And uh, I'm driving most of the discussions, but we've had both you and Xing Hao know about, more about Buddhism than I do. So uh, we let you take the lead on, on those and just sort of go through the basic ideas. And then we're going to read more and more books about the history of religious ideas. So Going tandem with that, we've got a course where we're reading um, Sacred Books of the East, uh, and that is a, a whole collection of, of about 50 volumes that were published over 100 years ago from Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, and uh, we've read the Quran and uh, the uh, Bhagavad Gita, the, uh, the Rig Veda, uh, the Zendavesta, and now we're reading uh, The Life of the Buddha in a, in a Chinese translation. Um, then yes, you are in the, the great books of the, the West, and there we have read uh, all the, the, that's a collection published by the University of Chicago Press uh, that has, um, goes in a pretty much historical chronological edition. So the earliest volumes are all the Greeks, and then it moves to the Romans and on to this, but um, they're sort of mixed up in terms of genre. So they have Homer as the first volume, and then this, and it was my, my sense that, um, it makes the most sense for us as a group to uh, read the historians first. The historians give us a concept of, of what the, the culture is and it was like, and gives us a background for reading the philosophy and the literature and understanding it better. So uh, we started with the historical books and we read Herodotus and Thucydides, and now uh, we're this week we're going to finish Plutarch's Lives, okay, which was uh, 900 pages, and we're reading about 30 pages a week, and so I figure we spent about nine months on Plutarch's Lives. Um, but our next book, the last historical book, is, is Tacitus, and he's a Roman historian, which we haven't looked at yet, and he's got a very fresh approach to writing about history, and it's, he's writing about the, the emperors and what's going on and, and all these things, and so it's a sort of a, a developmental history taking us from the Greeks into the Romans, um, it's a shorter book. It's only about 300 pages long. So we'll be able to finish that in uh, about uh, 10, 10 classes. So two and a half months. Uh, and then we can move on to literature. I think we'll start with the, uh, the Greek dramas and then uh, Homer uh, and uh, move on from there. That's quite a menu indeed. <laughs> and all of these are in small groups. And, um, you know, I said at the beginning how much I've, I've enjoyed participating and I'd encourage others if they're interested in these sorts of ideas and themes and, uh, yeah, to 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 get to give it a try, especially Tacitus is starting on ten and a half, uh, ten sessions, two and a half months. That's bite mm -hmm. size. That's bite size. Yeah, it is compared to Plutarch. Yeah, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. it is. Yeah, it's yeah. a pamphlet, or really, it's a pamphlet. Yeah, a pamphlet. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. Well, this has been so fascinating. Thank you very much, and um, I look forward to the sequel, Professor Alexander Aguayas. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. 
For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.